Hello, I'm Patrick Marr and welcome to my Summative Reflection Multimedia presentation. So the presentation is going to be split into different sections and it's going to cover the two year, well, two and a half years I've spent studying to ascertain the PGCE. So the presentation, first of all, is going to look to critically evaluate some key learning experiences for me over the two years. And, and there's been plenty, but we're going to narrow it down to three. Then we're going to look at inclusive learning, what strategies I've come with to make my lessons more inclusive, to cover a diverse classroom and make sure there's equal opportunities for all. Then look at functional skills as the third part, how I'm bedded into the classroom, what my current level of functional skills is for myself, what my learner's level is, how we can develop that within the classroom setting. Then we're going to look at my own subjects, how I continue to look to develop it, how I've worked with my mentor, how I've worked with my supervisor throughout to continue to look to develop my own specific subject knowledge. And then finally, we're going to look at some CPD actions to take forwards and some final parting thoughts. So jumping straight to it, we're now going to critically evaluate some key learning experiences. So learning experience number one was when I first joined Myasco, I was the traditional lecturer. I just dictated to the students. I spoke for half an hour, 40 minutes and then set them on a task. Um, and I wasn't that facilitator, which now I believe is what I am and that's what I want to be. So when I was at university, I used to sit in lectures for 50 minutes, uh, listen to the lecturer waffle on. I barely took on board any information, but that's all I'd known. So my first job and when I was working with my supervisors was understanding how I can be more of a facilitator in the classroom and how I can create a student focused environment. So the lecturer approach needs abolishing really there's a, there is a some there's a time and a place maybe if you're at a conference to listen to a lecture listen to an expert but for the students they're not exposed to problem solving situations and it's not a stimulating environment so i did my best to incorporate a variety of active learning strategies into the classroom whether it be um, peer assessment whether it be using any of the kagan strategies that we learned throughout teacher training reflections problem solving situations quizzes um, they were teaching delivering presentations debates discussions anything in a task form to help the students really really problem solve throughout their two years at my school and it definitely led to more in-depth learning and in addition to that I also incorporated flipped learning where possible and flipped learning is where you give the students almost like a pre-lesson homework task where they can do it on their own, they can do it at their own pace, whether that's a pre-recorded video of me speaking about the topic that we're going to cover in class or whether it's a journal or practical demonstration or, or a podcast. Uh, and then from there, they come in, they've got that underpinning knowledge and we can actually get into the nitty gritty. We can have discussions, we can have debates and it promoted more in-depth learning and that's something I want to take forward week on week make the flip learning more individual because at HE you've got smaller classrooms so it's easy to do so and I've just found it the classrooms become so much more interactive they felt more confident in their answers uh, and that was found from the feedback from the action research and their answers have become more, more critical and they've able to push their learning on. So the next significant learning experience was around classroom management and behaviour management. So I'm predominantly a HE lecturer, but I did have one FE module last year. It was a large class of around 25 learners and the classroom session took place after training. So they were always a little bit fatigued, a little bit tired, and I just found it, it really difficult to keep them focused. So what I did there was essentially relating to the behaviour management presentation. It was it was looking at the causes and what was causing this poor classroom behaviour. And a lot of that was the students were prioritising rugby over the lesson. They didn't see the importance of the lesson. They were here primarily in their minds for the sport. It was a lack of intrinsic motivation from them. They didn't want to improve and they couldn't see the benefits. And it was also to do with myself, to do with how I taught them. Um, that lecture approach that I mentioned before wasn't effective. I needed to think of more of a task-based approach to keep them engaged and motivated. So I came up with multiple solutions based off the research. So I tried to embed elements of humanism. So increasing their intrinsic motivation, 
because that's been shown to increase their task performance and persistence. They're more likely to use critical thinking and they're hopefully more likely to self-regulate, so get their assessments done on time. Um, and that came from helping them set goals and expectations, using the behaviorism approach to create positive reinforcement, using constructivism to set them problem-based tasks and making it relatable to them. Um, and it was also a case of, in, in oftentimes, they didn't have that prior knowledge. The learners didn't have that prior knowledge, so they were frustrated because I couldn't change the learning program. It was dictated to them in order to pass. So it was a case of, could we make them masters of their own learning? Could we embed aspects of spiral curriculum, help the learners know the why, and then they can build on that prior knowledge, embed formative assessment into the classroom so we can individualize that learning approach wherever we need to feed forward or feed back. Uh, and a variety of different strategies as we went through in order to improve that prior knowledge. Uh, and then finally, it was to do with prioritizing the sports. So, you know, we were never going to take that away from them. So I really tried to make the lessons relatable to them. So the lesson itself was physiology. So how can the learners having an understanding of physiology um, develop their on-field performance? So we were trying to look for like an interplay between their own existing knowledge and belief and then create new knowledges and experiences based on that relatability factor. And the final significant learning experience, which I imagine every teacher in the world has gone through due to COVID, is that transition to online learning. And I found that the research was minimal in terms of effective strategies, and it was a bit of a learning curve for everyone, that supervisors included. But I don't think it really changed in terms of the correct approach to learning and long-term attention involved creating an online environment that still allowed for human interaction, still allowed for discussions and debates and problem solving. So I was taking elements of the facilitator and the student focused face to face classroom and just transitioned them to online. And I thought that worked effectively using some new online strategies to keep the students engaged and focused like Teams breakout rooms, interactive whiteboard, Canvas quizzes. And I actually found it a lot easier to disseminate information, to quickly find journals, quickly upload it to the chat so they could find them. And in some cases, I actually found it more useful than the face-to-face -face lesson. Um, and at times, the, learner, the learners actually agreed with that. So those are my three significant learning experiences. We're now going to move on to the next section. So part two focuses on inclusion and inclusive learning. So I used to work in elite sport and I don't think this is really covered at all there, which is a real shame. So when I came to my school, it was, it was a real eye opener for me, learning about the different learning disabilities um, and learning difficulties that there are and how there's a continuum. Uh, different learners have different disabilities and they factor into that continuum and how you have to adapt to your teaching so they can get a differentiated approach that, that suits their learner needs and it, it's something I still need to improve on but it's something that I've really enjoyed kind of starting from scratch learning about the different disabilities and then putting strategies in place to help the learners whether that be um giving them extra time, um, giving them more of my time. For example, I only have small HE groups. So there's no reason why that that uh, the learning can't be completely individualized, individualized to them. So making sure I'm asking them whether they understand things, trying to keep my teaching more focused around them, some more student focused. So rather than me lecturing in long sentences, it's just short, snappy bullet points, putting the onus more on them trying to control my pace and not speaking too quickly. One of my learners, he likes to record some parts of the lessons. So he might, this allows him to watch it back so he can process it in his own time. It's trying to avoid uncomplicated words and use words that they're familiar with and sometimes using visual aids. And then I really like the work by Spooner et al in, in 2010 and they're talking about how much like learning disabilities uh, and our teaching has improved over the last few decades is obviously still the way to go. But they stress the importance of teachers having a deep knowledge uh, of both pedagogical strategies and their own subject. Uh, can they augment the general curriculums with communication, social and functional skills, and just combine it all together to create specialised instructional practices that are specific to the learner needs in front of you. 
So part three is going to focus on functional skills. So starting with myself. So obviously getting into teaching, you spend more time at the front and more practice presenting. I can remember my first lesson, I'd, I'd memorised the PowerPoint off by heart. I was that nervous. Whereas now I can just look at key points on the board uh, and, and then talk around them. I always had the subject knowledge, but it was the confidence in presenting. So my communication skills have, have improved significantly. I find that teaching is often, it's like a debate process. I'm asking the learners questions. The more intelligent they get, they ask me more advanced questions. And there's that little debate going on, the to and the fro. And that's crossed over in, into my coaching world. And then from a mathematical perspective, I'm teaching quite complex physics and biomechanics to the learners. Um, so it's something I have to make sure I'm obviously ahead of the learners in that situation, learning all the formulas, making sure I'm inputting the data correctly myself uh, and, and improving from that perspective. And then from an ICT perspective, obviously COVID's taken us online. So I've had to adapt how I can transfer information to the learners. So whether that's like sending them journal articles, uh, pre-recorded lectures as part of the flip learning task, directly dropping them hyperlinks to podcasts, using online strategies like Teams, interactive whiteboard. So my own ICT skills have gone through the roof, particularly due to the COVID situation. And then how I've improved my learners' functional skills um, is kind of like multifactorial. So we've done specific things like specific math starter tasks, not necessarily related to the lesson, uh, just going through the basics. It's something my learners ha had struggled with beforehand and it's something that has definitely helped them moving forward. From an English perspective, it's just making sure that the lessons incorporate discussions and debates, gives them a chance to be critical um, throughout. Uh, they're more confident in their discussions now. They're able to listen to their peers, provide effective feedback. They can speak and communicate better. They can listen in and understand different points of view uh, and evaluate and be more critical in their approach and they're able to now use the right language rather than jargon they can use the correct terminology sp specifically with like anatomy and physiology they're using the right terms that underpins everything within the strength conditioning field and then from a mathematics perspective part of the course requires them to collect data interpret data analyze it extract information from research and interpret it um, and then use it to determine the probability of a successful outcome. So throughout the course, throughout the two years, both my own functional skills and the learner's functional skills have developed like, kind of directly and indirectly from the course. Part four relates to my subject pedagogy and how I've developed that over the two years. So I really liked in the, in the teacher training when we looked at the Lee Shulman 2005 model, um, and I just think strength and conditioning kind of factors into all aspects of the triangle. So it's it's a course where you have to know the underpinning theory. You have to know uh, exactly what to do. You have to know the symbols, the equations that underpin it. But then you also have to, have to teach people. It's a case of how can you transfer that information. And then the course itself is very practical. So there's a physical nature, there's barbells, dumbbells. We've got to teach people exactly how to do those movements in order to transfer to their on-field performance. In terms of my own development, I've built a really good relationship with my mentor. We both come from a similar background. Both used to work in elite sport and then transitioned to teaching. And he, he showed me where to access the best journals. And by best journals, I mean the ones that have a practical component to them because our learner groups seem to benefit more from those rather than the text heavy ones. And then what he was fantastic at was, was showing me how to adapt those journals into tasks. So whether it be using their tables and getting the learners to kind of populate the tables or using the answers from the journal to then close the learning loop once the learners have had a go at figuring it out themselves. And then looking through my ILP, first off, it was about me finding the right journals and then improving my own subject knowledge as we went through. And then it transitioned into once the subject knowledge was there, it's how can I put in effective pedagogical strategies to transfer that information. And when I look through that ILP, that's what's de developed over the time. And that has had a significant effect on my learners. The more task-based approach that I employ now has definitely led to more in-depth learning. We can have more complicated discussions the learners feel like they could contribute whereas year one 
they didn't. It, it was short answers. It was more descriptive rather than moving on to the higher level uh, aspects of, um, of Bloom's taxonomy. So the final sections around my CPD action points and what I can do moving forward to develop my own learning. So what I need to cover still is how to deal with the FE classroom. I'm predominantly a HE lecturer, but it's the FE section that I've struggled with and I haven't had a chance to rectify this year due to my timetable. So that's an area I need to work with my mentor, with my supervisors going forward and the line manager, look at different strategies, trial and error, see what works for that specific learner group. So that'd be number one, would be behavior management within the FE classroom. I also want to go down the HE fellowship um, I was talking to my line manager the other day about signing up for the HE fellowship course after my PGCE and there's a lot of crossover in terms of the documentation anyway so I, I should be ahead of the game there really so that's number two is to complete the HE fellowship and finally it's just to continue to update my own subject knowledge and update my own teaching pedagogy so I can transfer that knowledge to the learners in an effective way my main improvement from my ILP, which I've used to form these action points, is the fact that I've transitioned to more of a facilitator. And now it's just a case of continually finding the up-to-date information, translate into the way that my specific learning group can understand and just make the lessons fun and engaging. I want the learners to enjoy to come into class, which is the experience I don't feel like I had when I was at university. So just some, some passing thoughts. The, the course has been great. I've come on a long way as a lecturer as well as a person, I feel so much more confident in delivery and that's transferred over to my coaching skills. I used to stand up in front of people and, and go bright red, I was nervous, sweating, whereas now it just it just feels natural. Obviously there is times where I'm still nervous, but I just feel a lot more confident in my delivery and, and I can put my points across to the learners and they're improving because of it. So I just wanna thank everyone who's been involved uh, in developing me over this, over this year, my supervisors, and my mentor, my line manager, as well as uh, my colleagues on the course, who, who've been great. And that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for listening.